Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good morning, good morning. The joy of the Lord is our strength Amen. this morning. Amen. Even Amen. in the shadows, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Um, <clears throat> I'm Vicki Perry, one of the de deacons here this morning, and Cecilia has given me the honors to come before you all and give a word. Um, I don't usually go this way on, on the message, but this is what the Lord gave me, and I thought, Lord, you are so funny. You have such sense of humor. Mm. Amen, amen, amen. He does have a sense of humor. I don't know. Does anybody ever, well, I watch YouTube now because I don't have Comcast anymore. I'm not paying that. But I was watching this movie. Ooh. And I thought, Lord, this speaks volumes to me. And the movie was The Ultimate Gift. Anybody ever watch that? Isn't that a great movie? But when it spoke to me, I, the Lord said, I want you to take in all the nine or the 12 gifts that he was given Amen. and think about them. But the first one is the one I want to expound on. And it's a hard one. It is a very hard one. Um, the movie is the ultimate gift. The movie begins as the grandfather dies and everybody in the family thinks they're going to get the inheritance. They're sitting at the table and one by one at the lawyer's table, they all disperse. And here comes little Jason. Under, I said, Lord, you couldn't give a better name to this guy than my, my son's name, Jason. But this, this is Drew Fuller, I think is his name. And he's late as usual. Because you know what? When you have a rich rich kid, snotty nose, rich kid. He doesn't have to be on time for anything. He doesn't have to do anything. It's on his own time. It's on his own time. And they were all done. They were all done. And all that was left was the lawyer. All that was left was the lawyer. So this person doesn't account to anybody. And he knows and thinks he knows everything and he thinks he can do anything he wants to do. What does that sound like? I think that sounds like me before I become a Christian. I think it sounds like me and each and every one of us in our former days. And, and I said, Lord, I said, was I really that snotty nose? But I wasn't rich. He said, oh, you were in your thoughts. You were in your thoughts. You thought you were rich. And because um, at that time, my husband, he made quite a bit of money at that time in I'm, I'm talking 40 years ago when $70,000 was like, you know, and I could buy just as much as I go wherever I wanted or buy. I could buy $100 shoes if I wanted to. Nowadays, $100 shoes is nothing, you know. So in it all, I said, I said, okay, okay, Lord. I said, you got this. So what does it sound like? Sounds like Jason had a little bit of pride. It sounds like Vicky had a little bit of pride. And sometimes I still have to fight a little bit of that pride. Every day I say, Lord, am I prideful in the areas that I need to give up to you? If we are not going to give those areas to the Lord, we're being prideful. We're in our own understanding. And I said, okay, Lord. Well, this grandfather, as some of you know in the movie, sets up these videos, 12 of them. And Jason has to listen to these videos. And he has to conquer each level as he goes down the road. And I think, I said, you know what? This grandfather had a lot of good wisdom in him. And, and the grandfather is James Gardner. What a wonderful actor that he is and he portrays in there. And he sits in this actor's chair and he's got this, he's doing this video and you can just see the expression on his face. He said, I know this child can do it. I have faith in him. I know that he can come forth and do what I think that is in him. What does that sound like? It sounds like the Holy Spirit for us. He said, I had faith in you even when I was a heathen. Even when I was doing my own thing, he said, I still know my daughter and my sons. They have a purpose and a plan, and I'm not going to let go of any of them. And you online, he's not letting go of any one of you online either. Amen. 
yeah, he said, I'm not letting go of you. So he said, James Gardner has big plans for Jason, but Jason doesn't know it. He sees that this boy that needs to be made into a man, and he wants that for his grandson. Even though he's dead now, he wants this for his grandson. Well, Jason thinks that, you know, he could just flub around and he'll just do a little bit here and there and he'll get his inheritance where nobody else got their inheritance. But old man Red was very wise. He said, he, he devised a crash course on his life, Jason's life. What does the Holy Spirit do to us? It's a crash course, isn't it? Oh my gosh, when I first came to the Lord, I'm going to tell you that crash course, it was, I didn't have a darn thing to wear in my closet after the Holy Ghost got, got a hold of me. I had to go out and buy all new clothes practically. There wasn't practically one thing in that closet that I could wear that was acceptable to him. Not one thing. And then my boys thought I was really nuts because I said to him, okay, there's no more swearing in this house. What? Mom, you swear. I said, well, not anymore. Not anymore. I got Jesus. I got Jesus. There's no more of this going on. So I had to take steps, though, with them. Uh, I had to institute, you say this word instead of this word. And then we went to the next step, and we said this word instead of this word. It wasn't a cut and dry thing, because I had teenagers at home when I got divorced. It wasn't an easy thing. They thought I was a Looney Tune that came out of outer space, even though they thought I was that way anyway, as a mother, you know. And then they used to throw at me, well, you're not supposed to be the head of the household. You're not a man. We're the men in the house. And I said, oh, I got news for you. By the word of God, I'm the head of this household. And I used to put them in their place, and it was a difficult road with them because they didn't understand where I was coming from. I, had, I hardly knew where I was coming from, let alone them. But in the just of it is, <clears throat> I knew, and those stepping stones, just like Jason went through those stepping stones, that I was going to reach a goal where I was free. So each assignment Jason conquers before he goes to the next step or test. First assignment is, he gives him, the lawyer, I forget what the lawyer's name is, he gives him this piece of paper, and it's a, it's a ticket. It's a ticket to go to Texas. What do I want to go to Texas for? I want to sleep. He thought he still had money in his account. But I think Red had a better plan for that. Amen. Okay, he goes and gets on the airplane. He sits in first class. Guess what? His ticket isn't for first class. <laughs> they have to ask him to move, and you know what he says? He said, I'm not moving. Do you know who I am? I'm Jason Stevens. Do you not know who I am? And the man says, I don't care who you are. Your ticket is not for first class. You have to go back to coach. Guess where he had to go in the coach? There was kids screaming and yelling and crying all over the place, and he's having a hairy. Isn't it just like the Holy Ghost to put you in a place where, oh, you know, I can't handle this any longer. So anyway, he finally gets to the airport, and he's waiting for his ride, and he thinks he's going to have a limo. He has this big brimmed hat man that comes up. And he said, oh, I'm your ride, Jason. And he takes him in this dumpy pickup truck. <laughs> and it's kind of neat how the Holy Spirit, I feel that the Holy Spirit orchestrated this whole thing, you know, with Jason because his pride was getting in the way. But I think with that pride, with the pride comes hurt, unforgiveness, Yes, the hurt and the unforgiveness, the, the hurt that isn't dealt with becomes the bitterness. And he was very bitter. He was very bitter because, see, his grandfather was the cause of his father dying when he was younger. And it doesn't tell you that at the beginning of the movie. It tells you at the end of the movie. And so in it all is he was an angry young man, very angry. So Gus picks him up at the airport, and they're going down the road in their truck, and he said, I want you to stop at the first convenience store. He said, oh, that was back there 20 miles or so. He says, you're on my ranch now. He says, this is a ranch? He says, this is desolate. There's no trees. There's no nothing. You know, he said, this is a ranch? <laughs> well, Jason is going to learn a lesson here. 
he's going to learn a big lesson because Jason doesn't even wake up the next morning for breakfast, but Gus gets him up and takes him out into that land where he's going to dig holes. He's going to dig holes. He's going to dig holes. Us intercessors, we dig holes. We dig wells. We dig wells for overflowing in the, in the freshness and the goodness of God. But in this olive, he comes along, Gus comes along, and it's dark time. And he hooks up a rope, a long rope to all these poles that he's got stuck in the ground. But he hasn't put any dirt around him or anything, and he pulls every one of them out. How many times have we, with the Holy Spirit, we think we got it? We got it. We got it. This. And the Holy Ghost says, uh-uh, pick it up. And he throws it. He says, uh-uh, that's not me. That's not me. Look at David. You know, many times he said, David, nope, that's not me. If you follow my footsteps, you will conquer the land. So finally, Jason gets it through his head. He's going to get up, and he's going to have breakfast the next day because he was pretty hungry the day before. And this goes on for a whole month. He has to do this for a whole month. And in that month's time is he put a line of poles all the way for miles. And Gus comes up and says, now you get in my truck. It's time to go home. So he got in the truck, and he takes him to the airport. Jason jumps out, but in this time, I want to back up a little bit. In this time that when Gus said it's time to go home, you could see there was a different countenance on Jason's face. His, his body language said a lot more than it did a month ago. He was learning the lesson that he needed to learn. And that's with us, with the Holy Spirit. There are lessons that the Holy Spirit teaches us so we can climb higher and higher and higher in him. He doesn't want us to stay where we are. He wants us to come up closer into his throne room, into his table, and dine and eat at his table. Amen. Yes. And so Jason gets out of the truck. You know, he's still got that pride. It's still there. It's still there. And he, and he, he leans in the, to the window. And he says, haven't you forgotten something? And oh, Gus, he's got a big smile on his face. And, I don't think so. And he pulls off. <laughs> Jason gets no wages. No wages for the month that he was there. How many times have we felt like we've been in a dry place with the Holy Spirit? And we've been in a dry place, and he's trying to teach us something, and we think we need to have something at the end of it. Just like a mother wants to give a, a, a good gift to their kids when they're very good, sometimes the Holy Spirit says, no, I can't give you anything right now. It will spoil the plan that I have for you. He said, I need to go to the next step and teach you what I want to teach you. So Jason, you know, he's, he's going. And he said, okay. So he comes home. Guess what his grandfather does now? <laughs> oh, I think this was so cool. I think this was so cool. He goes to his apartment. There's no furniture in his apartment. None. None. And he drives this big it's a, a charger, I think it is, a big muscle car, and you know, and he's, he loves this muscle car and everything else. And he goes down to the garage, and they're pulling away because they were waiting for him in the garage to take that car and take it from him. See, the Holy Spirit strips us. He strips us one by one by one. If he did it all at once, we wouldn't even want to serve him. But in the just of it is, it says, I'll take this today and we'll work on this for this month or two, whatever it takes us to work on it. And, and then he says, I want to take more from you. What more can we give but ourselves? But in it is, it's not basically ourselves, it's stuff. It's stuff. And I'm going to use my own self as an example that I'm moving and, and the gist of it is, I thought I would have time enough to sort through things and, and put things in a garage sale. Well, I didn't have time. And, and the thing is, I said, okay, Lord, I'll just take it and I'll box it all up and take it where I'm going, and then I'll have a garage sale. And the Lord had to really deal with me because I've been there 45 years. It's just stuff. It doesn't belong to you. I have given it to you. It doesn't belong to you. 
give it away. I thought, okay, okay. Because years ago, the Lord showed me my house never belonged to me to begin with. It belonged to the kingdom. And if you thought of it that way, that your belongings belong to the king, then some of the stuff you don't hold on to as hard as other stuff. And I knew my house belonged, and the land that I lived in belonged to the king. But I never thought of my little intimate, my precious little stuff. Oh, yeah, it belongs to the king. It all belongs to the king. And he says, intercessor, are we willing to give up more than just our time? It is our time, but are you willing to drop everything when I say, come, I need you to pray now. I want you to pray now. It's the time. This is what I'm calling you for. Pray now. Drop everything. Pull over the side of the road. Pray. And, and, And we've had to do that as intercessors. We do. And or maybe you had to call somebody and say the right uh, and encourage them or whatever. And you're doing something at home. And I, and I say, Lord, I'll do it in a minute. No, do it now. It's called obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience. And this is one of the things Jason had to learn was obedience. Obedience. I have Proverbs 16.5. It says, everyone that is proud in the heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though they join forces, and now another version says, though they join, join hand in hand, uh, they, none will go unpunished. If we're not willing to give up that pride, that unforgiveness, and that bitterness, God says, it doesn't belong to me. I went to the cross for that. Do you not know that I was nailed on that cross for that bitterness, that anger, that whatever that we hold on to that keeps us from going higher with the Lord? Whatever it is, I already went to the cross for it. Will you not walk in the freedom that I've called you to walk in? I am free. I am free, he said. I rose out of the cross, uh, out of the grave, excuse me, out of the grave, and I made you free by ascending and, and sitting next to the Father, because you sit right next to me. We are sons and daughters that sit right next to the Most High God. He is our provision. He is our provider. James 4, 6 says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. What a hard verse. What a hard verse. Proud is the same word described as a haughty or a haughty spirit. It means thinking of oneself better than anyone else, including God. There's no need for a God. I can do it all myself. I'm going to tell you one thing. When I, was, when I first got divorced, one of the things that the enemy used in my brain and, and why I got divorced is I don't need a man. I've been doing everything in, in this household myself for many years. Why do I need a man here? But I did. I knew within two weeks after getting divorced and he moved out, I knew that I needed that man in my house. And I did the wrong thing. That's a hard thing to swallow. I knew that I did the wrong thing. In my case, I knew that I did the wrong thing. I knew when I walked into the, into the courthouse, I had that check. I didn't know what that check meant. I had no clue what it meant. I didn't have the Lord then, but I knew that I was not supposed to walk in there. I changed my destiny. I changed my kid's destiny by not being obedient to a check that I didn't know what was. But I also knew, I did know that it was not what I was supposed to do. So anyway, there's that pride again. There's that pride again. There's that pride again. He hurt me so bad, I am going to do this to him, and I am going to get at him, and I am going to do this, and he's going to pay for everything he did to me. Pride and unforgiveness and bitterness, it got me. It got me to overflow that I was a bitter woman, a very bitter, angry woman, and it showed. My kids used to unruly, and that was why they were unruly, because I was bitter and angry and lashing out. That pride causes a lot of things in life. 
the hand that we talked about in that scripture, that's human effort. Because I like, I like the way, instead of forces, I like the way it says hand in hand. Hand means human effort. I can do it myself, Lord. I don't need you. Unpunished, unacquitted, held innocent. That's what that hand means in, in James 4, 6. But, but God, but God, but God, but God. There's another video. There's another video. But God, the Holy Spirit says there's more of me. There's more of me, says the Holy Spirit. The next video comes that Jason has to find a true friend. A true friend, one that he is dedicated to, which he doesn't think he needs, because all he needs is himself and the pawns that like him because he has a lot of money. But now he has no money. He goes to the restaurant with his girlfriend, and he can't even pay for this, this meal, and she gets up and leaves, and his credit cards don't work. Gus or Red made sure his credit cards didn't even work. Isn't that kind of funny? Isn't that kind of funny? Isn't that kind of funny? I remember when when I you know was divorced and I didn't have anything on the table, and you know what? The credit cards didn't work anymore because you they're maxed out. So who do you have to rely on? Now I'm a Christian. I have to rely on God's going to supply some food on the table for my kids. So now Jason's going to have to rely on that also but Jason's going to learn what true love is Jason needs a friend so badly that because now he's living in the streets he's living in he's living in a park and he has no place to go because nobody will let him in not even his mother because she's afraid she won't get her inheritance and she's probably told that she wouldn't and I think she was so you know what he meets this bum and he's on this bum's um, bench, and the bunch bum tells him to move, and Jason says, no, this is my bench. I had it today. And, and the bum says, uh-uh, mine, 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 mine. He had no compassion. He had no compassion for the bum yet. He wasn't able to show compassion. He's still in his anger and his bitterness and his pride. So he has no compassion in his heart for the bum because the bum has been on that bench for years. I thought, okay, God, okay, God. How many times have we walked down the street when I was younger and I said, oh, I don't want anything to do with them. I, I, you know, I, I'm sorry, I grew up in a, in a time frame of the 50s and the 60s that, you know what, there was no Afro-Americans in our neighborhood. So we didn't know how to intermingle with them. We didn't know how to, and we had to learn. But we, it was still... They had their place. I'm not that way now, but I'm just let, saying that was part of the bum on the bench. I would never have sat next to the bum on the bench. Today I would. Today I would. Today I would. So up comes this little girl named Emily. Oh, Emily's a smart little cookie. She's only about this high, but she's a smart little cookie. And, and she's in... Um, and her mother tells her, come on, come away from those two. She doesn't want them next to them two men, you know. And Emily says, oh, no, Mom, we're okay. But Emily already sees beyond. She sees into that spiritual realm that we all, as we pray and intercede for our loved ones and the people that God has called us to pray for and our country, we see beyond what the circumstances are. Emily saw beyond that. She wanted a mate for her dad or for her mom because she knew she was going to die. She had leukemia. And the story goes on and on. And Emily, she says, I'll be your friend because Jason promised there's a lot of money that he doesn't have, that he doesn't have. So he takes the family back to the lawyer's place and, 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 or the lawyer's how, or building or whatever. And he says, this is my true friend because this is the next step that he has to conquer. And he looks at the the guy, the lawyer looks at Emily and says, are you truly his friend? She says, oh yeah, I'm truly his friend. You can count on that. And I thought, you're lying. When I'm, uh, I'm watching the movie, you're lying. You're lying like a sack of potatoes. You know, but there was truth to some of it is they ended up being the best friends. 
So I'm going to ask you today, because this is a two-part ser series, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but in it is, through Emily, Jason learns to love. Jason learns that there's somebody besides himself. So the Holy Spirit is chipping away at Jason as he becomes a friend with Emily. But now he has to become friends with, his, with her mother, too. And the story is going on. And so if you'd like to go and watch it before next week, it would really be really nice if you do it. And, and I think you would enjoy it just as much as I do because I'm going to go on with the other steps next week. But in it all is, I want to read out of um, Proverbs 3. Because Proverbs is this, this month has really been speaking to me. <clears throat> I think it's Proverbs 4, I'm sorry. Hear, my children, the understanding of a father. Give attention to no understanding. I give you good doctrine. Intercessors, I have given you all the tools that you need to intercede and, and to come before my throne room. I have not left anything out for you. <laughs> when I was my father's son, tender, and the only one in the sight of my mother, he also taught me. He's talking about Jesus here. He also taught me and said to me, let your heart retain my words. If we read the word, we read the word, it engulfs in our hearts and in our spirits, and it ends up saying, and it ends up popping off the pages eventually, or maybe at that, that time, and it says, oh, I don't need this part. I don't need this part. I had to deal with the bitterness and the anger of my ex-husband so my kids could go on to where they needed to go on to. They could not go on unless I went on and I had to forgive and let go. That was part of my assignment of the Holy Spirit when I was, I was a new Christian. What a hard thing to do to say, I forgive you. No longer do I want to hold a grudge because that's part of forgiveness. I can't hold a grudge against you. I want to be able to my sons, I want my sons to be able to grow up and mature and be the men they were called to be. So I had to do that. It wasn't a choice because now I have the Holy Spirit. I'm baptized and have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I have to, if the Holy Spirit beckons you to do it, it isn't a choice, it's a command. So. He says, keep my commandments and commands and live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth and do not forsake her and she will preserve your life. Love her. I found a love in the Holy Spirit and Jesus that I never had ever in my whole life. From the time I was born until the time I accept Jesus Christ, I never knew what true love was. Jason was finding his true love by this little Emily that we were talking about. But the Holy Spirit will beckon us and woo us into that place and say, I love you. I have an unconditional love. You don't have to worry. You can trust me in knowing that I am at your beck and call. I'm right here. I'm your rear guard. I'm your light. I light your path in the way you're going. And I'm protecting you back here also. I am going for it with you. He's always with us. We just have to acknowledge that he's there. Love her and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal fair thing. Therefore, get wisdom in all you're getting, getting underst get understanding. Exalt her. See, he says her. The Holy Spirit is a her. I love it. It's not always a man, you know. And she will promote you. She will bring you honor. The honor is people can see Jesus through us. They don't see all the garbage. They don't see the bitterness, the anger, and everything that we have. He doesn't see that. They don't see that because it's gone. It's gone. It's no longer there. It's rooted up, and it's gone if you let the Holy Spirit deal with it. Deal you, or deal with it by the Holy Spirit, excuse me. Exalt her and she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will place on your head 
an ornament of grace. Grace, 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 grace. Nothing better than grace. Nothing better than grace. The grace and a crown of glory she will deliver you to. Amen. Let's get ready and take communion. <clears throat> so as we get ready to take communion, I really would like you to think about some things. And if you need to examine yourself, which we all do, and I do every time I take communion, even every morning. I, I very seldom miss a morning. I say, Lord, help me through this day. I can't make it without you. I need you. I need you every step of the day. Uh, every step of the way and every minute of the day, I need you. And so in it all is, and I do say to him, I said, Lord, I repent. I repent of anything that I've thought. Because my thoughts can go, I'm going to tell you, even now sometimes my thoughts go way over here and they should be right here, you know. And I'll say, Lord, I repent of those. I don't know where they came from, but immediately I'll repent of them. I said, Lord, take them away. What is underneath that? Take what's underneath that and help me to deal with that. And I repent of it. So I ask you now, before you take communion, to examine your hearts. Examine your hearts. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, almighty, everlasting Jesus. We glorify the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There is nothing better than you, Father God. There is nothing better that we desire but you, almighty Jesus. For I receive from the Lord what I also will pass on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was portrayed, took bread, his very body, he took bread. And when he gave thanks, he broke it. So we break this bread, Lord, for your broken body. This is my body, which is for you. This do in remembrance of me. Take and eat. In the same manner, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. Now, you've got to remember, they're sitting at the table together, the 12, as they're giving communion to Jesus is giving communion to them. He said, this is the covenant of the new covenant. He's reminding them that there's more to come of the new covenant. This isn't the end. This is just the beginning. In my blood, do this whenever you drink it. Remember in me. Drink. I thank you, Jesus. I really, um, I really think this is a time, and I'm going to open up the altars for you. I, um, I really feel that if you want to come up or you can stay in your seats, it's a time of reflection. I would really like you to reflect on what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about. And, and if you need to be ministered to, Cecilia and I are here if you need to have prayer. But right now, I, I really believe that the, the Holy Spirit wants to minister to each and every one of us. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.